Okay, there we go. So hello everyone and welcome to Discovering Plant Wisdom. My name is Juliet Bryant. For those of you who don't know me, I'm going to give a brief introdu introduction. I have been a nutritionist for 19 years now. I have been working with plants for a lot longer than that. Um, when I was about six, maybe seven years old, I remember being in the garden and really wanting to get growing. And my parents weren't very, uh, weren't really into um, natural things per se at that point. They weren't really into growing. We had a beautiful garden, but we had a gardener and they didn't really do much. They weren't kind of foraging type of people. And uh, I remember the desire to grow things. So I started to grow garlic and thyme and rosemary. And I had a little patch in the rockery that was mine to grow things. And uh, it was such a special thing. And I really cherished growing those things. And it started this journey for me. Well, actually it didn't start it. It reminded me of who I was. There was this natural feeling of wanting to work with the earth that as I said, didn't come from my parents. And what I found that was so beautiful along the way was you know, this deep remembrance of who I was, this deep awakening to what I think we all have in us, this deep connection to the earth. So I, as a, oh, sorry, let's just keep letting people in. As a um, grown up, I realized the importance of nutrition, so started studying nutrition. And I also worked as a healer, I worked as a meditation teacher. I've done lots of different things, but it was when I really started to grow food and started to forage that I felt the most at home, when I started to make my own medicines. And all of it really comes down to my oldest child because he awoke in me this desire to want to look after him in a different way, this desire to want to make my own remedies, not to be reliant on other people, but to know what I was doing, know what I was giving him. And so really it was through him that I awoke my desire to understand plants, to understand nutrition, to understand herbs. And as I said before, it was very much a remembering I've been working now for 19 years in the field of nutrition. And um, with that, I've also studied herbalism. I've studied lots of forms of nutrition. But what I realized is nutrition is one aspect. It's so limiting because it doesn't encompass the energetics. It doesn't encompass the spirit, the wisdom that the earth is sharing with us all the time. And this has really unraveled with me in my journey over the last however many years. And so that's what we're going to be sharing today. What was amazing was I was thinking about the opening, what I was going to say, and I've been planning the content. And tonight I was driving to pick my children up from school. And it was such an incredible thing because I was I was mulling over these words about plant wisdom and what the earth wanted to teach us and share with us. And suddenly this white owl flew in front of the car and it made me laugh because I felt it was very much a sign. And at that moment, I went, it's not just plant wisdom, it's earth wisdom. The plants are a massive part of it, but it's the earth's wisdom that I want to share. And then at that moment when that clicked because of the owl, a hare ran in front of the car. And I went, whoa, okay, another sign. It is definitely earth wisdom. And so I went, I'm gonna see a deer now in 30 seconds to really um, concrete in that this is earth wisdom that I'm teaching. This is, uh, I feel like I'm an earth wisdom keeper. And those words rolled through my being at that moment. And then a deer crossed the road right in front of me. And it was such an incredible thing seeing a white owl and then a hare and then a deer in such a beautiful short um, succession. Uh, so I really feel that those are guiding me, those animals and all the plants in what I will be sharing tonight. So I want to start by asking you all a question. What does plant wisdom or earth wisdom 
mean to you? So if you want to type it in the chat, what does earth wisdom or plant wisdom mean to you? What, what does it evoke in your being when you hear those words? So if you want to type it in the chat box, what does that mean to you? Someone said being connected to the earth. Connection. Beautiful. Divine connection, magic healing, the goddess. Beautiful. Nurture, lovely. Natural from nature, lovely. Synchronicity and flow, beautiful. Being whole or healed, living in connection with the earth and her seasons, pure. What beautiful words you're all using to describe. Or oh, magic enchantment, knowledge of the old, connection to source, beautiful. Such lovely words that are so evocative of what we're talking about. Understanding the connection between ourselves and the earth and how we support each other. Intuitive healing through nature. Beautiful. Beautiful. Being respectful to the earth wisdom. Lovely. So for those who have just joined, I've asked you to type in the chat, what does plant wisdom or earth wisdom mean to you? Great, great things so far. Such beautiful, beautiful things that you're all sharing. Thank you. So for me, when I think about plant wisdom, when I think about earth wisdom, these are things that have been part of our history and our culture forever. You know, if we look at plants, plants have been our companions, our healers, our teachers throughout the ages, and offering us an abundance of wisdom that spans the realms of medicine, nutrition, spirituality, environmental stewardship. And so it's really in this exploration of plant wisdom that we delve into this rich tapestry of insight that the earth has to offer us. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And we're gonna be looking at these different categories, the medicine, the nutrition, the spirituality and the environment and how when we can connect into these different areas through the plants, through the earth, we can have such a deeper understanding of ourself and our place in this beautiful planet. Recently, I was thinking about um, the fact that when we look at the earth, when we look at the trees, we are, okay, so I'm going to start that again. So basically, when we're looking at plant wisdom, when we're looking at how the trees work, how, how they look after each other, and also what we're doing to the earth, there's a very interesting um, thing that's going on. So let's say you've got a forest and in that forest, you've got saplings coming up. You've kind of got your teenage trees and you've got your old wise trees. So you've got this whole array and ages of trees all there. Now, what we've learned more recently as is that these trees are all communicating with each other. Now, they're communicating through the mycelium. Now, the mycelium is the mushroom network. So basically, the mycelium is a bright white filament that covers the whole planet. It interacts with every living species and it's the mushroom network. But through this mushroom network, this mycelium, what happens is the trees can communicate with each other. Not only can the trees communicate with each other, but they can also send nutrients through to other trees. So what they're now discovering is that what happens is a grandmother tree over here knows which trees are her saplings, which are in her family group, shall we say. OK, so this grandmother tree knows that in this acre of land she has all of these different trees that are in her family they're on her her watch shall we say 
So what she does as these little trees are growing up, which is so incredible, is she is constantly sending nutrients that they need to support their growth so that they can really thrive. She's also managing and looking out for if they if there's invaders, if there's anything that's coming that she needs to defend them against. And when I say defend, obviously she can't defend them against deer. Um, but for example, if there was a microbe or a fungus or something that was attacking the tree, she could send defense from her tree through to those younger trees. So basically she's created a nursery where she's um, nurturing all of these young on. Isn't that remarkable? So what happens is we come along as humans and we go, we're gonna chop down these trees because we want firewood or we want paper or whatever it is. We're going to chop down these big ones because there are little ones growing. So it's fine because they'll grow up and they'll soon be mature. But what we haven't seen is the impact that that's having on the whole uh, network and support of those young ones coming along. It's like us if we went, oh, we can take out those old ones. They've got no purpose for humans. But actually, it's those old ones that are feeding and nourishing and nurturing and looking after and loving the younger children. So this is something really interesting. And when I read this recently, it really resonated in my being. Um, not because so much of the way the trees are living, but how this can impact us as a species, because ultimately we're all communicating with the mycelium as well. We're all part of this network. So if we need help and support, we can also work through the mycelium, through this network to communicate and support each other. And we probably are doing that on some level subconsciously. You know, sometimes when we're around certain people, we can feel that pull of energy. Maybe some of you can feel that out of you because they need more, they need more support. So we are doing this exchange all the time, just like the trees are, just like the plants are. So the plant, the trees are doing this with each other. They're looking after each other. They're, they're looking out, they're supporting, they're nourishing. So this got me thinking to another level then. So if the trees are doing that for each other and potentially we're doing that for ourselves as well, then maybe the plants are doing this with us too. Maybe there's this deep exchange that's happening all the time between the plants communicating with us, helping us and we're helping them. So when I thought about this, when this came into my awareness, it really helped me to understand how I'm working already with the plants. And it really gave me the desire to run this two part masterclass to start to share this wisdom with everyone so that we can all start to tune in on this deeper level. So when we think about plants, when we think about this earth wisdom, for me, this earth wisdom is about looking at the seasons, looking at the signs that nature is giving us all the time, looking at what plants are present at certain types of the year, times of the year, to know how we can best work with them. Because ultimately the earth is so incredibly clever when we go through the season so for example one of the plants that really wanted to be talked about today are blackberries now blackberries are incredible i think of blackberries as the adapters they are they adapt to so many situations they are able to grow so abundantly and profusely in any terrain and they have this ability to adapt to whatever soil they're in, to whatever weather, and they just grow. How many of you have got brambles that are just overtaking areas? They take over because they have this ability to adapt, to deal with change. And one of the things that's very interesting when we're looking at the wisdom of plants, when we're looking at the earth wisdom, is looking at the clues that nature is giving us the signs of how those plants can help us. So when we look at blackberries, blackberries have this adaptive ability. They can go through 
turbulent ground. They're very good to be able to deal with stress. Blackberries can overcome lots of obstacles, can't they? You think of what they can overcome. Well, they can overcome loads. Nothing really stands in their way. So when you start to look at how they grow, what that plant is trying to show you is that if you work with it, it can help you because those are the lessons it's had. Does that make sense to everyone? If you could give me a thumbs up or a, a, a tick or a anything in the chat box to let me know that this is all making sense to you and resonating with you all. Brilliant. Great. So one of the things that we all know is that if someone has gone through a challenge, when they've gone through that challenge, there's an energy about them. And that energy says, I can help others now because I've been through this. And so when we see this energy in someone else, we may not know what they've gone through, but we, we get drawn to them. There's this magnetic resonance that pulls us towards them because we're like, oh yeah, I, I, I can feel something from that person. I really want to chat to them. And then you start chatting and you realize that they've gone through something similar that you're going through. And the reason you felt that magnetic resonance is because on some level, there's been that signal, like the mycelium saying, I can support you, I can help you, I've been through this. The plants are doing the same thing. So when we need that support because we're going through something, we need to look to nature and say, okay, what plants live in that way? What plants are adaptive? Because I need to adapt to some stressful situations. And then those plants are going to be able to impart that wisdom, that knowledge to us. So blackberries, black to blackberries, these adaptive plants. Blackberries also on a physical level are incredibly high in vitamin C. They're also very high in the purple pigment called um, anthocyanin. Now this pigment in those plants is very good for the immune system. So what the plant also shows us is it comes at the end of summer, just as the weather's starting to change, because it's a sign the earth is signaling to us it's time to prepare for the cold weather coming in. So what you need to do now is ramp up your vitamin C, ramp up your anthocyanins, ramp up those antioxidants so that I can support you to be in the fullest energy and strength as the weather changes. And at that time of year, we've also got the elderberries, exactly the same thing, high in vitamin C, high in anthocyanins, preparing the body for the coming change. So when we can start to live in this cyclical, tuned in way with nature, we start to see these cues all around us because it's the earth communicating. It's like a parent communicates that to their child. You wanna prepare your child for whatever's coming. You want them to be in the best health. You want them to, they, you know they've got a big day the next day because they're starting school or whatever it is. You want them to have an early night. You wanna give them lots of vitamin C. You wanna prepare them. Well, the earth is doing the same thing to us. She's our mother. So she's preparing us every step of the way, showing us signs and cues. But we have become so far removed from those signs and cues that we can't see them. And what I feel my job is, what I feel I've come to this earth to do is to share that, share those signs, share that wisdom that has been gifted to me that we all have in us. And I feel like I'm a signpost to redirect people back into the earth. It's like, no, you've gone the wrong way. Come back this way. Let's get back into the earth. So that's what we're looking at today. That's what we're gonna be uh, journeying into is how we can read these signposts. If anyone has any questions, as I said, as we go, please do type them into the chat box or any comments, um, then that's great. It's lovely to have your feedback and engagement as, as I talk to know that you're all uh, understanding and on the same wavelength and getting it all and if you don't get something I'm saying then please just say in the chat box I don't understand because if you don't someone else probably doesn't either so that's a little summary of of what we're looking at and what we're getting into over these next two days which is really exciting so when we look at um, plant wisdom when we look at 
these categories, as I said, the medicine, nutrition, spirituality, and the environmental side of things. First of all, we're going to look at medicinal wisdom. So plants have been used as medicine since the beginning of time. Indigenous cultures around the world have harnessed the healing properties of various plants to treat almost everything. And uh, the wisdom of herbalism really involves the understanding of the therapeutic properties of these different plants, such as their ability to reduce inflammation or to boost the immune system or to relieve pain, for example. And what's happened in society is modern medicine has continued to validate what has been known for thousands of years in traditional herbal medicine. And this validation has led to the creation of lots of the pharmaceutical medicines that we currently have now. So, for example, aspirin, which is one of the most widely used over the counter pain relievers, was originally derived from white willow bark. We have white willow bark in this house. We don't have aspirin because white willow bark is the original. And for me, I would much rather take the original plant than a synthetic version of it. Because also when you take the original plant, when you work with, for example, white willow bark or meadow sweet for pain, they're very gentle on the stomach, whereas the pharmaceutical versions can be quite harsh on the body, on the stomach. So when we look at how nature creates things, it creates it in a perfect balance with other things so that it's got the most gentle effect on our body. So modern medicine really has been built on our herbal knowledge. And when you look at the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, he said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And then he went on to say, let all treatment be first dietetic, which means all treatment for um, ailments should first be looked at through diet, as opposed to anything else. That's the first port of call. But unfortunately, in modern medicine, that's been thrown out of the window in a large extent. And so this is where we need to get back to. We don't want to throw out modern medicine because there are many life saving inventions, but we want to go back to the roots and look at what the earth is calling us to, what that wisdom is saying to us on a deeper level. When we look at the medicinal properties of plants, we look at heart medicines that have been made from foxgloves. Um, you know, there's so many different remedies that have been created and synthesized because obviously a plant can't be patented. But let's go back to the ancient roots and see what the earth is calling us to, because for me, that is such a, a powerhouse. That's such a, a beautiful place. Um, so I wanted to show you guys quickly. Ooh. If I can get it. I was gifted these beautiful books. Look at how old these books are. And what's super exciting about these books, I have to be very careful because I don't want to break it, is these are beautiful herbal books with all of this amazing information about plants in and these books are from where's the year in here look at that beautiful picture isn't that stunning of the passion flower these books are from 1848 and when you look at these books which i have done very gently and carefully <laughs> It's very interesting because the knowledge in there has not changed. They were spot on. So what we've known for so long is still there. A very interesting thing is when you look at um, a lot of the Amazonian tribes, the Amazonians had have uh, such a deep connection to the plants that hasn't left. They're still working with the plants all the time. And when you look at, for example, ayahuasca, which has become very popular in the West, ayahuasca is a, um, a vine that is consumed to open up people's awareness, to connect them to their spirit and to the spirit of the divine and that of the earth. And what's very interesting is when you take the vine of the ayahuasca, that vine, if consumed alone, would do nothing. It has to be combined with another plant 
to allow it to activate and for the body to be able to absorb the the uh, medicine within it now when the amazonian shamans were asked how they knew to combine these two plants which when um, studied by modern um, science could understand the mechanics of how this was all working there were inhibitors in one plant that stopped that allowed the body to actually uptake the dmt in the ayahuasca vine so what's so interesting is that the shaman said the plants told us the plants told us so they have understood a scientific interaction between plants through their deep connection to the plants, not through a lab that's telling them this is how it's working. And for me, when I heard that, it was such a beautiful remembering that we all have this ability. Now, slight disclaimer with all of this, always cross-reference if you're getting plants and do double check it's safe. It's very good to follow your intuition, but we do need to cross-reference and make sure that what we're taking and what we're looking at is not going to kill us. <laughs> a slight disclaimer in there so that we have that awareness. You know, there's so many beautiful books out there about plants that you can get to cross-reference what you're looking at outside in nature, that it is actually safe. Saying that, plants work on so many different levels. And this is one of the things that has fascinated me for so long is that we can work with plants in this multifaceted way now i'm going to explain this more so basically oh when i was pregnant with my first child my first child really gave me all these incredible awakenings into my truth uh, before that i was quite disconnected on many levels. I was connected on some, but I was quite disconnected in the, from my earth connection. I was kind of away with the fairies a little bit. I was very ungrounded. I was into healing and meditation and, and didn't like being here on this planet. I, it was too heavy, too dense. And when I became pregnant, I became very grounded in my body. And it was the first time really that this deep sinking into who I was happened. And so lots of awarenesses happened at that point. When I became pregnant with my son, I was on a two year crystal healing um, course I was studying. And I suddenly couldn't be around crystals. Now, it's really hard when you're doing a crystal healing course to not be able to be around crystals. It kind of uh, scuppers the works a little bit. So they just made me feel very ill. And my house was full of crystals. I had them all around me. I wore loads of crystals all over me. Suddenly I had to have get rid of them all. And I found it very hard because I was relying on these crystals energetically for lots of different things. Labradorite to psychically protect me, turquoise to help open my throat, all of these different things. Um, and what I found was that I couldn't be around them. So I suddenly thought, well, how am I going to protect myself? How am I going to work with anything? And what I realized was that because I understood the plants, the, the, sorry, not the plants, the crystals, because I understood their energetic signature, their vibration, I didn't need them. I could think about them and I could call them into my being. So, for example, if you have a friend, you know that friend, you know their energy, you can sit there and think about them and almost imagine them in front of you because you can tune into their vibration. Does this make sense to everyone? Give me a thumbs up if it's all making sense. Great, wonderful. So what I realized was that plants are exactly the same and mushrooms. And yes, I will be talking about fly agaric and other mushrooms at some point uh, in all of this. Um, so what I realized was that plants are the same. If you know a plant, if you can smell rosemary, for example, so I just all want you to take a moment to breathe in and smell rosemary. Can you smell it? Yeah, I'm seeing a few nods. 
So because you've smelt rosemary before, your muscle memory, your mind can transport you to rosemary. And you can bring in that energy, the vibration of that plant into your being. And this is such a powerful thing when we really start to understand this on a deeper level. Everything is vibration, everything. Sound is vibration, crystals are vibration, mushrooms are vibration, plants are vibration, trees are vibration, we're vibration. And when you know that note, because a vibration is sound, when you know that note, ah, uh, you can recall it whenever you want. Now, if I didn't know what middle C was, ah, uh, I couldn't recall it because I don't know it. But once I know it and I have that relationship, I can call it up anytime I want. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? Great. So we can bring in those plants that we need to work with. But first, we have to establish a physical relationship. We have to get to know them. We have to know how they smell, how they taste, how they feel to us, how they're working for us. Now, we can look at these amazing books and you don't have to have an old one from 1846 or to understand how plants work. We've got lots and lots of things, but it's really about understanding how they want to work with you. Because we're all individuals and we all hear things at a slightly different level. For me, what happened that was so exciting and so um, inspiring was that I started to hear sounds of plants. So I started to hear the song and it came to me with the plant mugwort. Mugwort's one of my favourites and I've got lots of it growing outside and it's one of the ones we're co covering on the plant wisdom mentorship. But mugwort is such a beautiful plant and one day I was sat with my mugwort and I thought, I wonder what their song of mugwort is. I wonder what it would sound like. I wonder what that story would be. If mugwort could talk to me, I wonder what she would say. I wonder what she would sing. And I closed my eyes and I heard her sing. And it was such a beautiful song. And it took me a bit by surprise because suddenly I could hear it. I could hear the plant. And then I thought, well, if Mugwort has a song, then Hawthorne must have a song. The oak tree must have a song. So I started to go on a bit of a mission to sit by trees and plants and ask them what their song was. And they all very willingly opened up their beautiful voices for me to hear. Now, some of you might be thinking, I've never heard of a plant sing. Like, what were you taking? Were you on the fly agaric mushrooms then? I wasn't. I was on no psychoactive substances. <laughs> but it's about tuning our awareness to a different frequency because it's like a radio. We're like radios. There are all of these frequencies going on around us all the time, but we tune in to a specific frequency. We dial in on the everyday 3D norm frequency, but it is within our perception to change those dials, to open up our perception so that we can hear in a different way. Has anyone heard plant sing or speak or communicate with them. Type it in the chat if you have. Or does anyone want to? Is anyone open for hearing this? Is the defo to you want to hear it or you have heard it? <laughs> you have amazing, brilliant. Definitely want to hear. Brilliant. I've heard. Amazing. I'd love to. Great. So for those of you who have heard the plant sing, briefly in the chat, can you describe what happened? How did it happen? Has it happened more than once? There's a few I'd love to. It's brilliant. And it's great that quite a few people have heard them. So when we, whilst people are typing, when we open up our perception, anything is possible. 
but it's about as i said switching into that reality of possibility that anything is possible so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little meditation to guide us into opening up our perception and it might not be that instantly you hear the hallelujah chorus and the heavens open and all your houseplants start singing to you they might i might have the um the orchids and the peace lily and the chili plant behind me all singing to me but it's about starting to listen someone said elder i used to live in a bender and she was my neighbor it was beautiful i haven't but would love to brilliant okay so we're going to do a little meditation now so if you want to get comfortable it's just going to be a short one because there's so much I want to share with you guys tonight. And we've also got tomorrow, which is great. So we can expand the sharing into more than one session. So I want you just to get comfortable right now. And just take a moment to connect into your breath. Feeling the earth beneath you. Whether it's through a seat, a cushion, a bed. But feeling that earth connection. And as you feel that earth connection, I want you to feel a slow melting. As if your body is starting to melt into the earth. You're releasing, melting, letting go. Into the earth. Letting your feet go into the earth, almost like a melting, a merging with the earth. And with each breath, you feel yourself melting more into the earth. And as you melt into the earth, as your awareness starts to travel into the beautiful earth, you become aware of the mycelium, this beautiful white filament of light covering the whole planet, interacting with every living being, every living tree and plant and animal and person. And as your awareness moves down into the earth, into the mycelium, you feel an expansion happening because suddenly you become part of the mycelium. Your awareness, your consciousness expands into everything. No longer are you limited just by this physical being, but you are expanding into the earth, into all that is. And as your consciousness expands through the mycelium, It gets taken, it gets pulled to a tree or a plant. Allow your awareness to move through it until you feel yourself coming up into a tree or a plant. Your awareness going into that tree or that plant or that mushroom. Feeling yourself merging with the energy of the tree, plant or mushroom. And feeling yourself as you merge with this tree, plant or mushroom, stepping back a little bit so that you can see what it is that you're merging with. Is it an elder or an oak or a dandelion or calendula, hawthorn, birch polypore? What is it that has pulled your awareness right now? And asking this plant, tree or mushroom, why they have pulled your awareness? What is it they want to communicate with you in this moment? Now, it might be that you can't see anything. You can feel something though. 
It might be that words pop in your mind. There's no right or wrong. Just allow yourself to be open to whatever experience the earth is wanting to share with you. And if nothing comes with you in this moment, just be open to allow energy to flow through you. So if you are there communing with a tree, a plant or a mushroom, asking it what it wants to communicate with you right now, I want you to ask it, how does it want to work with you? And just breathing the energy of this plant, tree or mushroom into your being. Feeling it moving through every cell in your body. Where do you feel it in your body? Where can you feel it resonating? This tree, plant or mushroom is giving you a gift of connection. It's giving you a gift of awakening. Awakening to this deeper way to communicate. And in this moment where you're connected with this tree, plant or mushroom, if you would like to ask it to sing for you, you can. And allow its song, its vibration to travel through your being. And as it travels through your being, it also travels through the mycelium. It travels through the earth, it travels through every plant, every mushroom, every being. How does that plant, tree or mushroom song make your song sound? Can you hear your song? Can you feel yourself harmonising? with this plant. And if you can't hear anything, that's okay. The songs are still being sung. Maybe if you can't hear, you can feel the vibration of the songs within your being. And as these songs are singing, yours and this plant that has called you to work with it, feel yourself merging again with this plant. Feel your song and their song merging. Feel this deep connection and resonance between this plant, tree or mushroom and yourself in this moment. And breathing as one. Allow your consciousness to slowly return into the earth, giving thanks to this plant, tree or mushroom. Feel your awareness moving slowly back into the earth, back into the mycelium, back into this expansion, this openness this connection with everything. And in this space where you're in the mycelium, where you're almost floating freely, allow yourself to take a moment to tune in and see what you can hear in the deep, beautiful earth.
and then slowly giving thanks to the earth, pulling your energy back up into your body. And as that energy comes back into your body, feel the slow, steady groundedness of the earth. Feel that deep nurturing and recharging energy of the earth as your energy comes back through your feet, through your legs, through your bottom, through your hips, all the way through every part of your body, feeling yourself grounding feeling your energy coming back into this present moment. And when you're ready, slowly opening your eyes and taking a moment to write down anything that came to you. You can write it in the chat, what plant came, if you could hear any of the songs, or you could write it in a notebook. But just taking a moment just to reflect on anything that came to you. And anyone who would like to share in the chat anything they experience, then please feel free to. Drumming. Nice. You could hear the plants or the mushrooms drumming. Did you have a mushroom? Is that what you had? Hence the little icon, maybe. There's definitely a sense of drumming, a pulsing beat of the earth. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share anything that came to them? Oak tree, deep guttural sound, felt his strength. Beautiful. I was pulled to an oak tree as well. Coriander, vibrancy on a cellular level, cleaning out. Amazing. Beautiful. Anyone else want to share aloe plant? What did the aloe have to say? Other than aloe vera. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad a few people found that funny. Uh, lime tree, protection, healing, safety, drumming, deep beats like heartbeats. Beautiful. So for those of you who heard sounds, were you surprised that you heard sounds? Were you expecting to or not? Could you hear your own sound? Large oak, I stepped back, watched myself within the oak being and connected so much more. Beautiful. Oak and peace. A lot of people got oak. Beautiful. I was going to, I was playing around with backgrounds and I was going to um, put one of those pictures as my background and it was of this beautiful oak tree the other day. Someone said, uh, favourite tree in Asa called me to her she wanted me to put my bare feet on the grass around her she sang to me i cannot explain it here i merged into her trunk and felt her love for me the earth noise below her was pops bumps and earth movements amazing experience thank you beautiful thank you ah uh, i understand the silence now thank you beautiful Oh, thank you all for sharing. It's really lovely to hear your experiences. You know, for me, I can talk all day and all night. But what I really feel is so important with all of this work is our own experience. The talking is great because it helps. Hopefully you can feel my experiences through my energy. And that can trigger an awakening within us when we're like I said, when we get called to someone who's been through something, who's done that work, we get called into their energy because their en our energy is ready to reach the next level. It's like the tuning forks. You hit two tuning forks and you bring them together and they start resonating together. And that's what we're doing with this work is when we come together with people who are on a path we want to be on, it's helping raise our vibration to that similar 
like the tuning forks coming together so that our vibrations can match. They say very interestingly, the five people that you spend the most time with is what your energy will be, who you're resonating with. So, you know, for me, I think it's really important. I think it's also not the just the five people, it's the plants. What plants are you hanging around? What trees are you hanging around? Because they are going to influence your energy and your field. Someone said, large evergreen tree connected to yesterday. I think a cedar heard a vibrational hum. I've been connecting with the mycelium over the last few weeks in the same way as you connected us. Beautiful. Amazing. So it sounds like a lot of you were able to have an experience. If you didn't have an experience, don't worry. You can listen to this again. And you can do that meditation again. And the more times we do these things, the more opens up. Because sometimes our conscious brain is not quite ready. And it takes a few times for our conscious brain to go, okay, I'm on board now. And allow the messages in because whether you hear or not hear, the songs are happening. Whether you feel your awareness traveling into the earth or not, it is. So it's about allowing ourselves to catch up. Does that make sense to everyone? So don't feel disheartened if you didn't get anything. I hope you all got something, whether it was just a good feeling or whether it was, uh, you know, more of an experience. Okay, so we've talked about the medicinal side of um, plant wisdom. So we want to look at the nutritional side for a minute. So plants are an abundant source of nourishment for humans. And when we look at the wisdom of plants in the context of nutrition, it involves understanding their nutritional content, their flavors, how they can be combined to create balance and healthy diets. And traditional food wisdom often rooted in cultural practices. So the emphasis has always been on eating a variety of plants for optimum health. So when we look at the realms of plant based nutrition, it's essential to really acknowledge the wisdom of these indigenous cultures. Ultimately, when we're looking at plant wisdom, it's about going back and remembering it, seeing what these indigenous cultures have done throughout time that we've chucked away, thinking it's not useful. And now we're going, actually, they've got better understanding than we do. So when we look at the indigenous cultures and their use of plant diets, one of the keys has been diversity. So this knowledge really reminds us of the importance of a diversity in our food choices for our own health and also for the health of the planet. When you look at the farming methods and these monoculture fields that we're growing. This isn't how nature grows. Nature grows in a beautiful permaculture way. You know, when you look at the permaculture system of forest gardens, nature is growing in canopies in layers, all different things together, because this gives a much better strength to the earth because certain plants take certain nutrients out of the soil. Other plants give nutrients to the soil. So when you've got this balance of it growing naturally, you're not pillaging the soil too much. Hopefully that makes sense. But also then on a physical level, when you have this diversity of plants that you're consuming, what you're doing is you're creating a um, much stronger uh, gut health. You're creating much stronger um, uh, defense within your body. So this is the aspect of the nutritional plant wisdom. So we've looked at the medicinal wisdom. We've looked at the nutritional wisdom. So these are all really important aspects when we're um, looking at plants, you know, that, as I said, it's a mini layered thing. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, that's, that's really what it boils down to. So how do we work with the plants on all these different levels? And we've had uh, an experience of the energetics of working with the plants, that vibrational resonance. But we need to look at all these other aspects as well. How can we bring our medicine back into nature? How can it be that we're working with the plants to create our own remedies so that we can really be in that most vibrant health? 
there was a brilliant um, study done in the Amazon and <clears throat> this uh, Amazonian shaman took a scientist out and they collected a certain medicine. The shaman showed him how to collect this medicine, how to make the medicine. They did it at the same time together, making two different remedies, but the same thing. And they analysed those remedies. Do you think they were the same? Hands up if you think they were the same. Hands up if you think they were different. They were different. The one that the shaman made was much stronger. Why? How? Exactly the same plants, exactly the same method. In fact, the shaman taught the guy how to do it. So you'd think they'd be the same because he was guiding him. The missing component was that energetic connection it's like food you can make food and eat it and have no awareness of what you're doing no awareness of the process no awareness of eating the food no gratitude no connection to that food we've all done it you know you're on the go you're busy you've grabbed something and you're just eating it and totally unaware of what you're actually doing or the conscious connection where you give thanks, you really taste it, you smell it, you feel it, you're engaged in the process. You're in a mindful space with it. Same goes for the medicine. We can connect and we can ask the plant to offer the medicine to us. And you know what? It increases its benefit. And this is where having this understanding of the plants, of how you can make your own medicines is so vitally important especially as the world is changing having that deeper understanding of what they're trying to say to us those plants and how they want you to work with them not how we think we should work with them and this is really the core of the work i'm doing now is how can we listen so that they can tell us what they want they can tell us when they're ready to be picked and how they want to do what they want to do be done with. If they want to be made into a tincture or a syrup, or if they want us just to sit and meditate with them. I was mentioning at the very beginning, you know, obviously we need to cross reference when we're foraging and we're doing things. But there are some plants that are toxic, but they want us to work with them, but in a different way not by consuming them but by sitting with them and being the yew tree for example is one of the most powerful protectors yew is a phenomenal protector and in fact if you go to most churches that are on ley lines yews are always there they're lay markers they're they're a sign that there is an energetic uh activity going on now, if you consume you berries, it's not really the berry, it's the seed in the centre of the berry. They will kill you. They are fatal. But that doesn't mean we should avoid use and their medicine. In fact, they've actually discovered that when you use the you in certain preparations, it can kill cancer cells. But obviously it has to be done very carefully because you don't want to kill you in the process. Um, and that's where you consuming it or working with it other than energetically would not be advised without proper uh, a proper uh, health practitioner to guide you in that snowdrops are another amazing example of this snowdrops in the right preparation have been shown in studies to cure dementia taken in the wrong preparation they'll kill you but again, it doesn't mean you can't sit with the plant and meditate and connect with it energetically, just like you can through sound, just like you can through crystals. So it's starting to get this deeper understanding, this deeper awareness of what the plants are saying. So when we're looking medicinally, we're looking at those, what can this do for me? How can this work? But also that deeper level, because a physical illness is not just a physical illness. 
everything has an, a mental, emotional, spiritual root. So we have to look when we're looking at the physical thing, we have to look at all these layers. So we can work with the plants and all these layers to heal all the layers through, not just working with it physically to heal the physical. Is everyone following? So, great. So, when we're looking at these different layers, and we're going to get into some of the more layers tomorrow. Um, sorry, my mind just went totally blank. <laughs> When we're looking at these different layers, when we're looking at the different ways that we can work with the plants, there's so much out there that we can uh, work with. Someone said, what was the plant you mentioned in connection to cancer? It was the yew tree. But as I said, the yew berries are highly poisonous and will kill you. Um, not the berry itself, but the seed in the middle. So it's something that, you know, has to be used with extreme, extreme care. Um, and I'm not recommending anyone here starts consuming toxic plants that could kill them. But it's just so that we can have this deeper understanding that plants are working on all these levels. So we can't shut something off because it's potentially toxic, like fly agaric mushroom. <coughs> the fly agaric mushroom is an incredible mushroom. It's the red and white one that is the most iconic mushroom uh, around. And it's the one that all the emojis are of. The fly agaric mushroom, if consumed in the wrong preparation, will kill you. It is toxic. In certain preparations, you'll go on a trip with it. In other preparations, it will remove pain physically from the body. Um, it, there's, there's stories about the fly agaric mushroom that the shamans would drink the reindeer pee because the reindeers had eaten the mushrooms. Um, there's other, uh, because that way the, the, the toxins were filtered out so they could then just absorb the um, psychoactive properties and commune with nature through the fly agaric mushroom. It's very toxic for the liver in the wrong preparation. If you just ate it, it would be very, very toxic for your liver and it would be a very uncomfortable slow death as it is with so many uh, different mushrooms out there. So you have to be very, very careful. But for example, with the fly agaric mushroom, one of the beliefs, one of the stories around it is not, it wasn't the shamans that were drinking from the reindeer. The shamans would put on the reindeer um, horns, like a, a hat with the reindeer horns and would call in the energy of the reindeer and they would consume the mushroom and then they would wee and they would offer that to the people to consume but the people in their in their tripping state would think of it as the reindeer you know so, so many of these things and we'll look at this more tomorrow more the spiritual side of things where plants are used more in this kind of psychoactive way to activate different centers of awareness uh, which has been done for a very long time you know the the celts the uh, amazonians all these different tribes have worked with psychoactive plants to connect us more deeply to different aspects of um, things that we can't see in this current state of reality opens our eyes um, but we're going to be talking about that side of things more tomorrow but the the fly agaric mushroom is this perfect example of these different layers of how we can work with something on you know from it being um, safe to consume on the skin when you apply it topically it removes uh, reduces trauma from the fascia of the body no psychoactive properties amazing to remove pain and trauma from the physical body but then you work with it through these other layers and it's going to heal you in so many different ways so really interesting how we can work so what I want to do in a moment is I'm going to open up to any questions that people have. I just want to talk about two other plants before I get to that. So um, we will go to questions in a minute. So when I was tuning into the plants about what I wanted to talk about tonight, what plants wanted to come through, um, there were a few that really stuck out and the bramble was one of them, the blackberry because of this adversity, this, this uh, ability to be adaptive. 
And then the other plant that wanted to come through was the hollyhock. Hollyhocks are such beautiful flowers and they, what's amazing is they grow everywhere. You know, you can see them growing in, in gravel, you can find them growing everywhere. But the hollyhock flower is incredible, pardon me, for healing coughs. Very good for the digestive system. It's been shown they're good for stomach ulcers. Um, the main way I work with them is for coughs. They're, they're very good to treat coughs. But then you can look at them on a different level and they're very much about abundance, bringing that abundance in because when they grow, they grow abundantly. You know, you can have loads of them in an area and when they flower, there's an abundance of flowers. So again, we can work with them on the physical level, good for coughs, good for digestion, or we can look at them on that deeper level of going, okay, they really have this abundant feeling. I don't know if any of you have grown hollyhocks and seen that amazing display of flowers that they can give us. And that abundant feeling that you get from them. Has anyone experienced that with hollyhocks? Yeah. So, you know, the hollyhock for me is, is such a, a lovely one. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's also the abundance is about that depth of colour. There's such an incredible depth of colour that you can see in them. Some of them are this deep purple. Some of them are bright pink. You know, there's, there's an array of, of magic that comes from them. So when you're working with the plants, have this thought. How, how are they working with you? How, what are they showing to you when you see them? So when you see something growing, maybe it's in nature, it's in your garden. What is it trying to communicate with you? And I'd love you to have a think about this and maybe place it up in the Facebook group. Um, you know, some of the plants that are communicating to you, they're in your garden and maybe share it in here now. Um, but have a think over this, mull it over. Maybe you can share it tomorrow when we are on the call tomorrow. What plants are around you in your environment and what are they trying to say? So start looking in this different way. Look in this way that you haven't looked before, maybe. Look at what is around you. Because so often the answers that we need are literally right in front of our face. So the other one that I wanted to talk about was garlic. Now garlic, wild garlic, planted garlic, whatever kind of garlic you want to look at. Garlic is, I feel very much about service. So why is it about service? That's kind of a weird word, isn't it? Well, when I tune into garlic, garlic gives us so much. So it's amazing for coughs, amazing for colds, amazing antiviral, it's antimicrobial, it's antibacterial, it's antifungal. So it's got all these properties that it's giving us. <clears throat> It's, you know, let's take wild garlic, for example. It's abundant, it comes out in abundance. There's loads of it, you know, between kind of April and June time. It's like, poof. if you've ever walked past a patch of wild garlic, that, that smell is so strong. But medicinally, it's got so much it's giving us. And I feel it's really um, being of service to humanity um, to keep us well, <laughs> to keep us healthy. So for me, garlic is very much a service thing. And when I see the wild garlic, it reminds me of how can I be of service to society? How can I be of service? Because if the plants that I'm using are doing that job, then I feel that I need to do that as well. So we get cues, don't we? Not just of how something wants to work with us, but how we need to work with society, how we need to leave that imprint. Just like the plant is leaving an imprint, what imprint are we leaving? And how can we ask the earth, how can that wisdom of the earth guide us in that? Does that make sense to everyone? Someone said, wild garlic grows most in ancient woodlands, wisdom. Yeah, it totally is wisdom. Yeah, for sure. Um, wild garlic does have a very deep wisdom about it. Uh, you know, wisdom on how to... One of the things actually about garlic that is a deep wisdom is that antibiotics, for example, 
target good and bad bacteria. They don't discriminate. I'm talking about antibiotics you would get from the, the pharmacies. Now, garlic has 39 different antibiotic strains to it, 39. But what's incredible about nature, and this is wisdom at its best, is that garlic is able to target bad bacteria because bad bacteria has a different geometrical structure to good bacteria. So it doesn't go in and indiscriminately wipe out all of our gut bacteria. It just targets the specific bacteria it needs to. Now that is wisdom, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that for me is like, wow, the natural world is incredible. And you know what? We're all part of the natural world. So we are all just as incredible and just as wise as that amazing garlic. We just have to remember that. We just have to wake up to it. And so hopefully this is helping you and guiding you into that remembrance, into that waking up, into that feeling of wisdom, of knowledge, of connection that we all have. Okay, so enough talking from me. I'm going to open up the floor to any questions that you guys have before we finish the session this evening. But don't worry, there's more tomorrow. I hope you have enjoyed this evening. Uh, I will answer questions, but um, we're going to get into a lot more amazing stuff tomorrow. So does anyone have any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself now if you do. Are there any questions? If you don't want to unmute yourself, you can type your questions in the chat as well. Oh, two people have unmuted. Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, hello, Julia. Thanks very much. Loved every yeah. minute of going along with the floor, for sure. Amazing. And um, at the beginning, you mentioned about the, the big trees, like the grandma tree looking after the smaller trees. And there's some things that they can't control, like the deer is eating the younger leaves and things. Also, it, uh, I do a lot of gardening and in, in one place, and I've got to know the plants a lot. Um, and the ivy grows up quite a lot of the trees. And how, you know, you can you can stop the ivy from growing by like chopping it at the bottom and it's growing up all these big trees and choking them and then they're dying. How is it that I need to get that balance between, I've got to ask them, <laughs> I think I've answered it myself. Get that balance from how much ivy do you chop off to let the bigger trees grow or are the bigger trees, how they don't finish. It's like, have you ever thought, how, when does a tree stop growing? It doesn't, does it? <laughs> no, yeah. trees, are, trees are always growing. It's a tricky thing, you know, it's like, um, you know, when you see a bird falling out of a nest, mm. you know, or when you see... I don't eat animals, but when you see another animal eating another animal, all those things are hard. It's a, it's quite a hard battle. And there yeah. is a battle out there between for, for dominance, for light, for resources. So there is also a thing of just trusting the natural world and the natural order to, to um, sort itself out. And it does. There is always a balance and there always has. If you leave a forest to just do its thing, it will do its thing and the trees will manage and manage each other you know so yeah. often and this is nothing on you but so often as a human we feel like we need to interject with nature we need to um play god you know and 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 fix things and i think this is where a lot of the problems come because so often if you just leave nature to sort itself out it does um so i think that's you know obviously if it's in your garden chopping back some of the ivy you can use ivy as an amazing um washing uh, powder you ivy leaves can contain saponin so you can actually use them to clean clothes um so maybe you can utilize the ivy for that which will control it naturally uh, in that way i hope that's helped yeah yeah that's great thanks absolutely Thank fantastic you. i got a cramp in my leg that's why i had to jump up <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I've had that. I've I've had my legs going to sleep a bit, so I've been moving as I've been doing this as well. It's hard to sit for too long, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, uh, who's next? 
Um, it's yeah. me, Juliet Catria. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you? Hello. How are you? Good. Um, I just wanted to say uh, something around the energetic feeling of the earth. Um, you know, when our mutual friend Dawny was unwell and um, we were taking care of her, when I went into the middle of a herb wheel on the land and laid right in the middle, I felt as if M Mother Earth took me but was holding me and protecting me. And since then, when there's been unsettlement, each time I walk into my garden, which is near Epping Forest, I really feel held. Mm. It, it's, it's, it's not easy to describe without people thinking you're completely bonkers, but it's just that feeling of walking on the bare earth and being in amongst the mature trees, there's definitely some sort of healing energy there. I yeah. feel it and I sense it. Beautiful. So I do everything that you kind of, not everything that you've described, but I, I feel that there is definitely something out there energetically. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't respect what, what she's offering us on so many levels and I feel sad with that I think I think you're right but there is a there is a risk so once people feel that connection once people feel that then the respect comes because you realize that the earth is our mother and that's yeah. that feeling you know for me through many times of my life I've done the same thing I've gone onto the earth and I've just you know felt that being held and it's such an amazing feeling of being held by the earth and you go, it's okay, I've got this, I can do this. Yeah, yeah. Because you know that you're supported. And I think that is, is such a phenomenal gift. And when people feel that, the respect will come. And yeah. that's why, you know, more and more people are waking up to this now. And that's the exciting thing. Yeah, that's great. That's great news. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that experience with us. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah. Louise, do you want to say something? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, um, at the beginning, you mentioned aspirin from the white willow bark and another pain plant. Um, can you remember what it was? Yeah, meadow sweet. That's it. Meadow sweet is incredible and it's more gentle than the white willow uh, as a pain relief. It's it's the salicylic acid, but it's very, very gentle on the digestive system and works really beautifully. Um, I, I, I make um, a lovely glyceride, a pain glyceride, and I use poppy petals. I use um, the meadow sweet. I use some white willow bark. Um, I usually put a bit of... Um, hemp in there as well and just a sec meadow sweet poppy petals white, white willow bark yeah um a bit of hemp hemp as in the hemp seed or actual hemp so the leaf and the flower because that's an amazing just in small amounts is an amazing a pain support okay so white willow bark meadow sweet poppy petals and white white hemp i mean poppy mm -hmm. petals yes. and hemp yeah. it's just that i've just made uh a glycerin that i'm going to make some truck um sweet out of called dream weaver and that's got all the blue lotus but i've I, like since summer i've just gone crazily into it all so something switched and i've got some oximal brains on oximal on the window ledge and some glycerins going and other things coming into a mid and rose raw chocolates which are amazing so i'm sort of prepping my world and getting better <laughs> brilliant brilliant the other thing you can add in is mugwort uh, oh gosh thing. that's in the dream weaver as well i've got that i haven't yeah. started growing them all yet but that'll come <laughs> yeah 
yeah exactly it does once you start you know my garden has grown into a medicinal herb garden because i've got all the things that i would potentially forage all just growing in my garden so that i don't have to go anywhere other than my garden to go and collect it so i've got my mugwort you know i've got a meadow sweet i don't have growing i've got it across the road from me but i'm going to grow it next year in my garden um you know I've got, I've got all these different plants that i can access so i can make those medicines and they're growing in my vibration which yeah. means they're even more tuned in and i'm feeding them with my menstrual blood and you know all of these amazing things mm. we can do to vibe them up so well done for getting into this uh, groove louise thank you i mean it's great because i'm thinking like i'm not I, I'm not the best grower in the world and I've not got that much space, but I'm thinking a medicinal garden is more important than the other stuff at the moment. Um, Definitely. Yeah, no, I love it. And it can still be beautiful and pretty. It's like hollyhock flowers are amazing, but they're medicinal. So for us, it's like, you know, I want flowers, but I want everything to have a purpose um, to support me and the earth uh, and my family and friends. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I'm doing it to sort of support my son's anxiety, the lack of sleep, my daughter's energy for all the training she's coming that's coming up. There's lots of reasons for it. Or yeah. Yeah. um the well we have blackberries, the wild stuff and the herbs. Do you need to wash them before using them if they've been grown organically? So um if it's grown organically in your garden or somewhere you know, then I personally don't wash unless they're covered in mud. Um you know but because you want the bacteria that's on them uh, yeah. where possible obviously blackberries if they're you know i would potentially give them a wash because you've got lots of flies landing on them and all that kind right. of stuff um but you know i also just eat them straight off the bush and <laughs> right <trust> my gut. <laughs> you showed a picture of you with some um rose hips rose hip syrup what's the best way of doing it and do you use normal sugar with it so I would never use refined sugar. I hate the stuff. It's toxic waste. Um, yeah. So when you're making a syrup, always use unrefined sugar. Um, I've got unrefined organic sugar, but it's quite pale still. Yeah, that's fine because at least it's unrefined. So you're not, it's not been stripped of all its goodness. So you can use that. One of my favorite ways to make a rosehip syrup, it takes a while though, is a cold pressed one. Um, right some videos somewhere i think they're on my tiktok um on how to make an a, a cold pressed rose hip syrup but basically you put the rose hips and the sugar on a windowsill and you leave it for like four weeks and it slowly the sugar dissolves and you put it somewhere where it's got sunlight so it's it's getting that kind of infusion and you're getting this cold press rosehip syrup because one of the things about the rosehip syrup that's always irritated me is when you heat rose hips you're destroying some of the vitamin c content right so if you've got it done raw then that's absolutely incredible you can also do it with uh, honey you okay to... so i've got them frozen at the moment ready to go i've topped and tailed them but they're whole do i put them in the blend um chop them up no so what you want to do is leave them whole um just squish them a bit um but the seeds inside you don't want to be eating so you need to be straining it out so once you've made once the if you're doing a cold press one for example and i'll try and find the videos that i did on it then um once the sugar's all melted and turned into liquid, then you then strain it through a muslin bag and give it a really good squeeze. So you're getting all the liquid out, but it's holding all the seeds and the hairs, which is the itching yeah. part of it. Yeah, I did worry about the killing everything off by getting it too hot. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a fine balance. You, you know, mm. I've got loads of dried rose hips that I've dried in the dehydrator because that's another thing you can do to dry the rose hips in the dehydrator. Not got that far yet. <laughs> You can dry them in the oven as well at low temperature and then you can use them to make teas you can put them in smoothies you can eat them um so beautiful to eat so dried things last a really long time so for example i dry elderberries uh, i dry uh, lots and lots of different things so that i've always got them whenever i need them to make a fresh tea or a fresh syrup or something like that or you know tinctures are the other way that you can do it okay Right. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Someone said, loved listening. Thank you. What plants can help with cognitive decline, prevention and support for those with dementia? 
loads of great things out there. So lion's mane mushroom is one of the best ones. Um, now you can't forage lion's mane because it's on the protected, protected list, but you can grow it with a mushroom growing kit or my mushroom tincture um, is an amazing uh, thing that you can use, which has got lion's mane, reishi, chaga, um, turkey tails and cordyceps uh, in. Uh, so that's very good for cognitive decline. Ginkgo biloba um, is another one. The ginkgo um, a tree is incredible for cognitive decline. Um, things like tulsi and ashwagandha are, are useful and supportive. Um, Gotta cola is another great one. Um, I've got a, um, a teacher that I've made called Connect which is very good for brain support, which has got lots of these different herbs in to support cognitive function. But those are a few of the things that can help it. Um, with cognitive function, one of the things I think is, you know, uh, making sure you've got essential fat, making sure you've got vitamin D, magnesium, these kind of key nutritional points that are going to affect it and then bringing the herbs in as well, because we're looking at all those kind of different layers. So hopefully that's uh, helpful. Okay thank you guys we have reached the end of this evening it's been really lovely being with you all i hope you've enjoyed it i've loved your energy and your input uh, so uh, thank you very very much we're back tomorrow same time yay and we're going to get into the spiritual side of the plants we're going to get into um uh the, the kind of energetics of it even more and we're going to dive into more plants so um really really uh looking forward to it uh, so thank you all for being here and uh see you tomorrow thank you juliet it's been a pleasure listening to you again bless you thank you lots of love lots of love to you bye for now Thank you. Bye. Oh, Thanks. can you try and put that in the um, Facebook? The rose hips. I will. Thank I will you. do my best. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Bye. No Bye. Bye.